Good afternoon. You probably remember the fake microphone. So I'll be introducing our speaker, and then and we'll actually have some broadcast sound, I think. Actually, this sounds like it might be broadcasting today, but uh, it's not. No, then I will continue to speak loudly. Um, welcome to the College of Architecture, Planning, and Design Distinguished Lecturer in Landscape Architecture. We are thrilled to have Lucinda Sanders, who is the CEO and partner of Olin, with us today. Her, the title of her talk is Dig Deep. Olin has a wonderful, rich history of creating places through landscape architecture and urban design and planning and dedicating themselves to the social interactions that people have and creating an enhanced quality of life. We are especially pleased to have Cindy with us because they have a real focus right now on issues of the 21st century city and they are thinking about many of the same issues that all of you are thinking about. We also are very interested in their commitment to research and as a college that has recently converted to all graduate degrees, this is a really timely um, lecture for us to have. Olin has, actually has a director of research and they have a very unique perspective on how they incorporate that work into their practice. Um, to give you a little bit of background, Cindy studied at Rutgers and then went on to receive a Master's of Landscape Architecture at Penn, and she is also an adjunct faculty member at Penn, which I haven't quite figured out how she's managing this wonderful international practice as well as being an adjunct faculty member, and I think we're getting a little hint of all of that. Um, she's already been in the studio with fourth-year landscape architecture students and will continue to meet with students. If you are interested in the ideas that you hear here today and you want to have more interactions while she's here, um, the schedule is posted on the studio doors. And even if you're not enrolled in the classes that she'll be visiting, please feel free to visit. Um, so look at the, the topic of the class and feel free to join if, if you'd like to. So please join me in welcoming Cindy Sanders. Thank you, Stephanie. I think I have my speakers and recordings all hooked up properly. It's a delight to be here today, and I hate to tell you guys because I like to teach. Nothing is ever simple when I talk about it. Um, and it's usually reflective, so you have to bear with me as I look backwards a little bit over time. And I know everybody's interested in what's going on today, um, but it's really, I think that you can be a better practitioner, professor, when you understand context and when you understand the situation that arises around what we're doing today as practitioners. Um, I teach professional practice, which sounds really boring, I know, um, but it's actually very fun for me um, because I start my class off by reminding the students that they're actually being dropped when they come into school. They're being dropped on a moving train or a moving vehicle, that the profession isn't static. And one of the things that keeps the profession from being static are external forces, but as important are, is the reaction of landscape architects to those forces and being out ahead and leading. Um, so that's really, in a nutshell, what today is about for me. It's why I called my lecture Dig Deep because the reality is um, for you to be good, uh, you can't just be shallow. And it's becoming more and more and more apparent to me that being good means that you have to be at the table with so many people a vast array of people, and you have to be able to converse with them. You may not know all of the answers, but you certainly need to know the right questions to be asking. Um, so what I'm going to do 
is to take you through a little bit of time history. Um, we jump around a little bit, so if you get confused, just wave your arms and I'll clarify. Um, the social sciences have had an impact on our profession. I want to talk about that a little bit. Economics. Um, we are just really beginning to understand the economics of landscape, and that is an evolving piece. The natural sciences. Well, of course we work in natural systems, um, but one realizes how shaky that foundation is. Greenfield, brownfield, grayfield, my goodness, we are practicing in lots of places, and roof as floor. Um, roofs have become floors to us. They have become landscapes to us. Horizontal becomes vertical. We're only seeing the very beginnings of that. Um, Systems-based approach to design. It's kind of a moment where we're bringing things together. Landscape performance. Um, hot topic. Very hot topic. And all of this stuff that's happened before has to do with building that foundation so that we're able to have a dialogue about landscape performance. This is sort of, you know, the time where you are now. It didn't just happen. There's a lot of history to it. And there's a lot of sort of fragile structure behind it. It's not as good as it could be. It really is on the cusp of, we're on the cusp of having those dialogues. And leadership. Um, what's going on with landscape architects in leadership positions and um, a little bit about how that's evolved. So I'd like to get started. Um, I finished my graduate studies in the early 80s. And one of the things, I didn't realize this when I entered the profession, but there were a lot of things that were going on in the world that actually impacted um, our practice. And one of them was the return to the city. This is a map of the US. Um, I'm dying to find a map of the world to have this conversation. But the fact that people are more and more people are living in cities, and the fact that less and less of our landscape is untouched. It is touched in some fashion. Um, very, very small percentage, close to pristine. Um, less than 1%. That's pretty profound. It means that people are making decisions about the land every day, and the landscape architect is having an ever-increasing role in that. But what happened as people move back into cities? Well, behavior. Hmm. How do we coexist in these landscapes? And Bryant Park was really Olin's first foray into these conversations. And who was the great social scientist back then? None other than William H. White. Um, and Jane Jacobs, I think, are the two names that we all know and we honor, we respect. Um, I honestly believe there's a great hole in today with our social sciences and landscape architecture. The bridge is not that strong. Space Syntax out of London is one company who is doing some work around this. But since our work at Bryant Park, I'll be honest with you, I don't think there has been a tremendous amount of advancement. This was pretty amazing, the fact that we understood, we started to understand why people weren't using the park. You know, they would go in at lunchtime, and the rest of the time they were terrified because it was being occupied by another population that people were afraid of, i.e. the drug dealers. And in fact, um, the physical design of that, we realized, thanks to William White, who consulted on this, that people felt trapped. They couldn't get out of the space. Um, and that, that dialogue 
is one of the things that led to the transformation. It was a moment in time where people became aware that physical design actually can impact behavior along that same time with Holly White was this notion that, gee, if you give people some things to do, some clues about um, how to use this space, that in fact behavior too can be impacted. So everything from programming um, to cafes, ticket booths, movies, et cetera, um, were added into the concept of Bryant Park. I don't know how many of you have been there today, but in my view, it gets over-programmed. It's being turned into a commercial arena, so questions of balance. What, what is privatization versus um, public? And so lots of interesting conversations get opened around this, but this was a watershed moment. Um, and I love this image because I know Holly White would have a field day with it. Um, look at how everybody's spaced. If you saw his studies about how people occupy benches, you know, they come in, they sit at one end, they'll sit at the other, or they'll occupy another bench before a, they start filling in. People space themselves in very predictable ways. Now we can enter into conversation. Is that the same here as it is in India? And that too gets into some very interesting dialogues, which is why I think they're, quite frankly, some serious holes. I want to talk another, about another piece of um, social sciences, and that is process. Um, Something that didn't happen when I entered the profession was this, happened so much, was this idea of community engagement. And why is this happening? Projects are happening in places where people are, okay? They're not just, or, you know, when I entered the profession, there were a lot of greenfield projects going on, so they weren't impacting communities so much. But when the return to the city, people started caring about what was going on, and they wanted to have a say in their own environment. And one of what we have to be able to do now is hold effective community engagement processes. And those can take the shapes of workshops um, where people are moving pieces around, um, people having conversations about program and impact of program on their community. Um, these little post-it notes, people making suggestions and organizing those suggestions to actually leading tours um, on a project site and getting people familiar with what will be going on on those projects. It takes many different forms now and we find as an office we absolutely have to be facile with that engagement process. And it's, it's not getting less, it's getting more. Um, so learning how to do that well is very, very important. I'm going to talk a little bit about the natural sciences. When I entered the profession, um, we had a soil spec, and it talked about silt, sand, and clay, and gravel. And it talked about nitrogen, and potassium, and wow. That was about it. Why was that? Why was that? Well, we go back and think about who cared about soil in America. Well, the agronomists cared about soil. And the geotechnical engineers cared about soil. People cared about it for stability purposes, and they cared about soil for growing crops. There wasn't a whole um, range beyond that. And what that meant to us, when we're thinking about making landscapes in cities, we weren't so challenged before when we were making landscapes in green fields. But when we tried making them in cities and we saw massive failures of trees that didn't live beyond 10 years, um, pavements that didn't hold up, um, all of a sudden a whole new 
field or side of landscape architecture opened up where we had to become conversant. Nobody's out there saying, gee, I think landscape architects are going to need to know how to do soils. Um, we, we, Olin and others, started asking those questions. Now, there were a few bridge soil scientists, Phil Kral, Nina Basick, Jim Urban, who are out there. I call them bridge because they're actually, they, they come from the soil science industry and they're interested in having dialogues with landscape architects. But that's not a one-sided conversation. Landscape architects need to be interested in having the dialogue with them as well. So it's a two-way street. And what I'm trying to tell you guys is you need to be able and be interested in having those conversations. That's actually something that happened in this topic of soils. You know, how do you come in and build a landscape, in this case Wagner Park, on a fill site that has very uneven drainage and has been a helicopter landing pad? Um, and that needs to be able to sustain massive amounts of public use. Well, I learned a lot about soils. I mean, i be honest with you, I came the closest to a lawsuit that I've ever come to over the issues of soils. Um, people simply didn't know what they were doing. What I've learned about soil scientists is they don't all agree. Um, and so sorting your way through those conversations is really, really complicated. Um, so I was a young associate at the time working on this project um, for Wagner Park, and I had to deal with things like surcharging. Okay, we're leading this project, so you darn well better be sure that the things that are going to be proposed here don't sink. Um, surcharging, wow, how do you, long do you have to do it? And here I am trying to advise the client, okay? So for me to advise a client, I have to be learning these things and I have to be gathering information and making a case. I learned about engineered soils on this project. Um, so taking out some of the lousy soils, um, figuring out how to manufacture soils, what kind of base do you build from, build those soils from. And it sounds like, well, this isn't design. Well, it really is. <laughs> to be able to design in this world today, you have to know this stuff to make it work. Um, and how do you support different plant material with different soils? What's the variation? How much organic matter in a lawn versus how much organic matter in a perennial border? Um, these were all questions we had to understand. And this landscape, over time, as the layers came in, is something that sustains a very intense level of human activity. It also sustains a very rich plant palette. Um, tied to that is understanding what the client has to maintain, um, maintain these landscapes and what landscapes are appropriate for their maintenance, budgets, and skill set. I'm going to talk about water a little bit. I, I, before I end the soils conversation, um, <laughs> I was with Michael Van Valkenburg a couple of months ago, and we were being interviewed for an article. And Michael said, you know, the soil stuff, it's still voodoo science, you guys. You need to know it's still voodoo science. And what he meant is, we don't know everything. We simply do not know everything. We're doing the best we can with what we know. We know a lot more today than we did, certainly 25 years ago. But we are still learning about soils. We're still learning about manufacturing soils um, and maintaining soils and not hauling soils from hundreds of miles away. What does this mean? What does it look like? Um, so I found it very interesting that he too is struggling with some of these topics as we all are. Um, water, wow, when I started in the office we had this project um, 
for the Codex Corporation. And it was very interesting because it was one of the first projects that actually used water to cool a building. And there's a ready supply of water on the site. Um, they used it to make the pond. They used it to run it through the building. Um, and it was innovative in its time, but it really did not have the level of understanding that we have today about water. A project that we did for MIT in the mid-90s um, with Frank Gehry really um, forced us to deal with water. And why was that? Because of regulation. The rest of the world is worrying about water now. And this project wouldn't have been built had we not come up with an innovative water solution. It's a project we worked with Judith Nitsch um, out of Boston, an engineer. One of the um, engineers that I can count on one hand who's out there who really grasps the innovation that's required um, when dealing with stormwater. And it's a shame that there still aren't, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 engineers out there you could pick up the phone and call. Literally, I can count them all on one hand. Um, people that I want to sit across the table from and work these problems out with. Um, she's, she's terrific. This particular project um, took the stormwater off of not only the new building, but um, adjacent buildings and captured it, filtered it, captured it in a tank, um, used solar panels, pumped the water back up for toilet flushing. Um, no additional storm water could be discharged into the storm sewer system. That was the rule. That was the regulation that was imposed. And that regulation is what, impo what caused the innovation. Um, necessity is the mother of invention is kind of another theme that one might, might <laughs> put on this talk. And this is what that tank looked like um, for storing water. You can see how big it is with the people. And this is the landscape as it got built on top of that, st uh, that storm system. And the students love this. It is um, the, one of the criticisms, though, is that people wanted to know more about it. And so what we think is cool, um, and we get what's going on here. Um, many of the students at MIT said, look, we'd like to know more about the process. How do you make that visible? And so there's a whole signage program that actually arose out of this, which was kind of intriguing. Um, Climate, hmm. Well, we were given this site in Cleveland. It looked like this. It's on top of a parking garage. It's a federal building. And we were told that it's so windy here, people actually fall over. Wow. Um, they, they get blown over, and they had to install a whole series of handrails so that they wouldn't blow over. And <laughs> That was pretty serious. I mean, you don't want to design something and have people um, experience that. So we had to call other engineers to the table to help us with an analysis, a wind analysis. Really, what is going on? Um, what's happening as the wind comes off the lake and hits the building? Um, and how does it circulate? And in fact, um, this particular engineer said, we can help you, which was kind of fun because we've known wind tunnel analyses, but they were able to apply their programs to our landscape and begin to analyze some of the things that we were doing, creating an internal space, using topography. Um, and they were able to come back and analyze our design. Um, they were able to tell us things we could do to rough up the surface, um, and how we might be able to reduce the wind. And then they came back and analyzed it. And it was this back and forth process until we got the wind levels to, to down to a mild roar. 
um, in a scheme that looks like this, that um, was just opened and won at a, a GSA award. And really, it's, it's a landscape that has many different spaces in it, but really one of the big frames for this landscape was dealing with the wind issue. Economics. <clears throat> I never really thought about how Battery Park City was built out, um, but it's actually how many, land, many developments, urban developments, are getting built out. It was a model for its time. Um, this is the mile-long esplanade along the Hudson River, and we did the master planning effort with um, Cooper Eckstead in the late 70s. And what, the way they actually built this place was to build the infrastructure and build the landscape. And then the development came in. They would build the next piece of infrastructure, build the landscape, and then the development came in. And it was very interesting that the landscape was preceding the development. Um, it was placemaking. It was giving the developer a sense of the place that would be there. This was a high-risk um, development for its time. And it was, it's really very fascinating the way it built, was built, and it's essentially complete today. Um, again, this esplanade was key to getting these developments um, in place. It was the vision. Likewise, what happened at Bryant Park is happening more and more today. People are understanding that landscape creates value. Remember, back when the drug dealers were in here, they were actually depressing value. People saw cities as dirty places to be, but as people move back into the city, more control over the environment, what happens with a, something like a Bryant Park is the values of the real estate um, uh, that surround the park increase. We're seeing that in the um, Jim Corner's uh, Highline project today, Michael Van Valkenburg's Brooklyn Bridge Park, this notion that landscape creates value is a relatively new idea um, in, in our generation. Another thing about economics is how do these landscapes get built? Who pays for them? This is a very complex and growing science art, if you will. Um, there are a couple of people out there who are phenomenal in their um, understanding of this. One of them is John Auschuler from HRNA out of New York City, um, beginning to really get their arms around the different structures for creating and paying for landscape. Um, Bryant Park was a city-owned park. However, its renovation was through a public-private partnership. Those dollars were not all public dollars. Those dollars were coming from private funding sources to, to build, to rebuild this park. And it's a model that's used today. There are many other models that are emerging. Um, in this particular case with the Presidio, um, it was a former army base and it was transitioned to a park, so post to park. And one of the interesting things, one of the interesting restrictions that was put on this transition um, for a national park was that it had to be financially sustainable by the year 2013. So not only are people thinking of um, sustainability around ecology and social systems, but they're thinking of it economically. That has a big impact on our parks and how they look. Um, it usually means that there are other revenue generating items. Um, we need to be able to have those conversations. As we worked on our project at the Presidio, we had to be able to plug into that construct and understand that 
our project too had to have some, not, not only great artistry around what we were doing, but it had to address this issue of economic sustainability and revenue generation over time. Green fields, brown fields, gray fields. Um, most everybody in the 70s and early 80s were practicing in green fields. And I would say that Olin was probably no exception at that time. Um, but there were a couple of things that we were doing when we were presented with a green field project. And one was to understand that an agrarian landscape, um, gee, should that really all be lawn? <laughs> Um, it seemed crazy to us, and we used it as a ground for experimenting with creating a meadow. People are doing meadows all over the place today, and they're specialists. But this project was done back in the late 70s, um, where we started experimenting and wondering, gee, it would be kind of nice if this landscape looked more like it belonged there as opposed to um, something artificial. And yet, it's all constructed, it's all created, and man, did we have our problems with building this landscape because not many people had done it before. Um, the soils were extremely challenging, but over a couple of years, we were actually able to get this meadow established and have it look looking pretty good and having the client understand how it was managed. These issues are not just technical issues, but they're issues in getting client buy-in, too. As the leadership at Johnson & Johnson changed and employees started putting little comments in his box and saying, we think this meadow doesn't fit our aesthetic. We really like the lawn look. Um, they caved, and it became a lawn which this is a project well before its time. So sometimes great ideas, um, wrong timing. And because landscapes are living systems, they are quite vulnerable. Uh, brownfields. I'm sure your studio projects may take on these issues of brownfields. Um, why are we dealing with brownfields today? Well, we're dealing with them because of the deindustrialization of America. Okay, we're responding to a condition. Um, we're responding to uh, land in places where people want to be. And that creates a whole new set of questions and conditions for us to be thinking about. This particular project, Mission Bay, um, was Really, there were firms noodling around with this for a decade. By the time it came to us in the mid-90s, um, we pretty much came up with um, a team of individuals and came up with an urban design very connected to the downtown. And yes, this is where the Giants are playing, and sadly not the Phillies, but we'll let that one go. Um, but it's interesting to me when I look back at this project and realize that the solution to the brownfield was to cap the soils. So contaminated soils, cap it, which capping is the most rapid course to being able to develop. But what's happened? Hmm, the economy, and we've had a slump. Things are not developing quite so rapidly. At the time this project was conceived of, um, maybe a few people were uttering the words of phytoremediation in studios and classrooms, um, but it hadn't caught on yet. And I look at this project and think, wow, this would have been an amazing opportunity for phytoremediation.
But again, the science, we, we sort of know it's out there, but exactly how we would apply it takes somebody really caring deeply enough about it to figure it out, to make an economic case for it, to get client buy-in. These things take intense, deep focus to make them happen. And I think landscape architects are very well positioned to do that. Um, nevertheless, we did, we have gotten um, some of this landscape built. Some of the development has occurred. Um, and it, it will transit, transform over time, perhaps not as innovatively as maybe it could have had this project gone forward today. Gray fields, um, the Presidio project, um, big parking lot for us and what to do with that parking lot. I remember we had this great idea, everybody was behind us um, to take this asphalt, churn it up and use it as fill rather than importing a bunch of fill or exporting, taking this asphalt to the dumps. Um, and we were, all set to go and somebody said you can't do that it's going to contaminate the groundwater and this project ultimately died for another reason not for the reason of the asphalt but had it gone forward that was going to be one of my charges to get to the bottom of that issue because it was a very significant um, construct for us in how we were thinking about it, how we were, we thought we were being sustainable, but were we really, were we really contaminating? Um, so if you are interested in these topics, nobody comes to you with all of the research ready at hand. It, it means digging, digging deep. And this was the image of the transformation of that parking lot into um, the ex transform parade ground. This is Hargrave's Chrissy Field down below. Um, and the idea that this landscape was going to um, be built over Doyle Drive, which was severing the top from the bottom, and these two landscapes would be connected. Um, so it did not, as I say, it didn't go ahead. It was a fabulous project, and perhaps one day one of you guys will have the opportunity to work on it. Um, roof is floor. Here we are. We're, we're, we're working. We're being challenged to, to work brownfield, grayfield, dealing with those issues, um, working with roofs as ground. Um, is something that our office has done since Bryant Park. I suppose you could consider it one of the first green roofs. Um, in fact, we didn't even know that language back then. We didn't call them green roofs. Um, whoops, sorry about that. I think I fast forwarded. Um, what happened with Bryant Park, again, is the library needed to expand. If they couldn't expand, they were going to be out of there, the, the library, as you know, abuts Bryant Park. And this idea was developed that they could actually have their stacks under the park. And so all of the lawn is actually over the stacks of the New York Public Library. Um, and over the last several decades, we have done a lot of landscapes over structure, as we prefer to call them. Um, from Independence National Historic Park in Philadelphia to Celebrezzi in Cleveland to Fountain Square in Cincinnati um, and Canary Wharf in England. These are the before pictures or the construction pictures and these are the after pictures of those landscapes. So all of those landscapes have a structure. That has required us to develop a great deal of technical expertise internally about how to make a landscape um, that can thrive on top of structure. My partner, Susan Weiler, has written um, the green, uh, the, the landscape over structure book that was just um, published a, a year or so ago. These are a couple of other examples from rail yards 
um, now with the landscape over them. And um, the sculpture garden in Philadelphia with a parking garage. This is the parking garage and a landscape, a sculpture garden on top of that parking garage. This integration of landscape and architecture is um, certainly something that we are going to see more and more of over the years. Horizontal becomes vertical. Olin has barely scratched the surface. I mean, there are a lot of people doing some interesting things on this topic, um, but we have been very interested in building green screens, some of them internal, some of them external, um, some of them custom designed, some of them off the shelf. Um, and this is down in the Grand Cayman Islands, these green screens adjacent to the parking area. Um, systems approach to design. One of the things that's happened is I've kind of taken, I've pulled out aspects of projects to describe um, some of the expertise that one has to have, but I think that the 90s started to be that time when people were pulling um, various pieces together. If I looked at the 70s, I would say a lot of people were wrestling with formal issues. They were wrestling with Ian McCarg de um, design with nature, what that meant. Um, to me, the 80s were pushing us to think about other systems as we move back into the cities, how we sustain them. And in the 90s, we start pulling those pieces together and looking, I think, at understanding that landscape is a system. Um, this was a competition that I entered in San Antonio. Um, I really believed the system thing, so I looked at the whole United States rather than just the site. Um, but I was interested in where our national forests and parks are, and I was trying to make a case how important this landscape was um, and how valuable it was because there wasn't a heck, a lot, a heck of a lot of um, national land around, around San Antonio. I was also very interested in the prairie um, and that by the time it gets down to San Antonio, it's the Blackland Prairie and very, 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 very little of the Blackland Prairie remains. Um, so I was building an argument about why this landscape should become a prairie landscape. Um, I was also interested in the ecosystems and how they join at San Antonio. Now, mind you, I'm working with one of the, I think, foremost ecologists of our time, Steve Windhager from Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, who has just been made the executive director of the Santa Barbara um, Botanic Garden. Um, he is sitting with me and I'm asking him questions and neither of us are getting paid to do this competition, but you know, I love him and he loves me. I love him because he answers all my questions. He loves me because I keep asking him. And this is how great dialogue happens. Um, he's giving me information and he's putting me onto people who can have conversations about the water issues that are, exist around San Antonio, the aquifers and the impact our site that we're looking at and its relationship to the aquifer issue. We're looking at systems of parks in San Antonio and how this park might plug into a future system. This is the site. And this was the proposal that we made that was about the recreation of a prairie, a Blackland Prairie, um, that had a, the insertion of program into it. It had an understanding of the hill country, the difference between the prairie and the hill country. And we're looking at these systems and how they relate to one another and stack 
and interface with one another, everything from the aquifer to the plant material to circulation and um, human occupation of the land. We are understanding diagrams of carbon and the prairie as a very, very effective sequester of carbon. We're understanding water, how we might use water and recharge water on this landscape. We're also understanding systems of management and how over time these, the prairie was managed by fire, by grazing, the difference between the savanna, the woodland, and the grassland. Um, and we're explaining and understanding these different systems, which you know very well here, um, since I've learned your wonderful prairie. Um, everything from our traditional system of mowing to grazing to burning and interest in how these landscapes can be maintained over time to produce dramatically different results just by the timing of the burn produces a very different matrix of plants. And this dilemma that we all face um, when we create these great ecological systems, the interface of humans over a calendar year and the vision for that landscape. Um, and really, again, emphasizing the coexistence of ecology and human occupation and the balance and how that could occur. Another system, um, this is just a campus, an example of a campus. And I put it up here because um, this has to do with sophistication of clients. Um, I would say almost every campus thinks of their landscape through their buildings. So donor, building gets done, it must sit adjacent to a landscape. And that is not how landscape on campus functions. This is at Yale. Um, this was a breakthrough for us to get Yale to think of this piece of the campus um, as a system, not building by building by building, which they had traditionally been doing. But it's a system of walkways. It's a system of greens. It's a water system. Um, the water moves through this landscape as a system. It's a service system, and it's a building system. Um, and that's a major breakthrough to sit and convince a client that they need to think about their landscape in a different way and to fund it in a different way. This is our um, award-winning Kroon Hall um, project in it, at Yale, um, lead platinum building, and with an amazing system of water treatment system, um, with plants that are removing particulate matter. I mean, it's, it is just phenomenal. Um, the level of detail and the sophistication between this project and MIT 10 years earlier. So our learning curve, the, again, a d done with Judith Nitch, you know, somebody who's going to sit across the table with us and push, keep pushing, not be satisfied with where we were 10 years ago. Um, and one other system, Mill River Project in Stamford, Connecticut. It's a river that runs through the city and a network of roads and neighborhoods. And the, the river for decades had been seen as a depressor of environment, as a severer of connection. And the whole goal was to think of all of the systems, the roads, the river, um, and the ultimate connection of a green system, um, a social system. How does the social system work in this landscape? Um, a plant system, the different ecologies that occur along this river sectionally, and the installation and character of 
of that system and the rebuilding of the river. This is what the river looked like. It had been channelized, there was a dam. We worked with the Army Corps of Engineers, which was very challenging um, to interface with them. And it was a building, how, how do you stop a river to build something in it, right? You have to kind of push it over to one side, you have to build a channel so that it flows on one side and you can actually build the work on the other side. This whole system of, of, of actually making it, making it happen. Um, and this is what it looks like pretty much today. It's still under construction, but taking out all that channel. Um, and what's happened here is the whole flooding of this river has changed dramatically. It used to flood the downtown, and now there's a place for the flood waters to go. Landscape performance. Um, boy, this has been a challenge. I sit on the board of the Landscape Architecture Foundation, and we are working very mightily on the Landscape Performance Series, you know, the Sustainable Sites Initiative that is coming out of Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, the ASLA, and the U.S. Um, Botanic Garden, um, the, the partners, the three partners on that initiative. Landscape performance is not an easy topic, and we are just, even with all that stuff we've, I've showed you so far, we're really just hitting the tip of the iceberg. Um, I think we are seeing the end of what I call greenwash. Everybody, you haven't heard me use the word sustainability very much today because everybody claims sustainability, we're sustainable. And it's, what does that mean, honestly? And so this landscape performance, the sustainable sites is beginning to push us in a direction where we can talk about our landscapes from um, a deeper level of understanding around how they're actually doing and performing. But I'll tell you, I, I decided I would try this out on a client. And I tried it out on the client I have for the Delaware River in Philadelphia. Seven miles of landscape and proposed development along the river. And I thought, you know, I'm gonna practice what I preach. And we had this great construct um, with our economics advisor that this really was going to be um, low and mid-rise development, dense, so a solid street wall, not a suburban kind of development, and it was going to be organized by a network of open space, by a rich network. Well, that seems like a great construct. Um, but we also, as landscape architects, said that this, land, this development was going to be ecologically driven and economically driven. It was not going to be just economically driven. And we put together this presentation for them describing that an ecologically driven landscape has other considerations, different considerations for systematically incorporating ecological function and performance into the landscape versus the economy driven. And what we realized as we started to do this is we needed to set goals, we needed to measure a baseline, Seems easy, but I'll tell you that baseline information simply doesn't exist in most cases. We need to set targets, and then we need to figure out how we implement this. Is this policy? Is it a design guideline? Is it wishful thinking? Um, you know, I never imagined that these issues would be there before us. Um, and then teaching the client, we were having lunch with Ian and a couple of other students today, um, and the topic came up of clients. We were talking about clients, and I, you know, my, my conclusion was I really want clients who are about your age, um, who are <laughs> thinking very in very contemporary fashions, because really most of my clients are 
40s, 50s, 60s, um, who are in positions of authority and who don't fully get it just yet. And it's going to take time to get a client base out there that gets it. Um, so I look forward to living another three decades so that I can experience that. Um, why adopt ecological goals? Well, you know, going back to some fundamentals, you know, everybody knows lead. We, we get lead. People get lead. Clients get lead. They probably didn't get lead 20 years ago, 15 years ago, but they're getting it now. Um, what, what's in its pilot phase is a sustainable sites initiative. Olin has four projects in it. There are 170 projects that are in this pilot phase. And it's very landscape focused as opposed to building focused. Why do we care about this? We care a lot about it because a lead platinum building sitting in the middle of nowhere that people have to drive 25, 30 miles to, what, how good is that? It's, it's, it, it's a um, refusal to look at the significance of system, right? The whole system, not just the object, but the entire system and landscape is about that system, and it's why I think it's so incredibly profound. And um, I could say I think we're, we understand that as a group of human beings, we understand that better than anybody else. Um, talked about that already. So here's this project, and I'm trying to convince them that we need to think this way. And so what do I do? I turn to things that have already been done in Philadelphia, the mayor's Greenworks plan, that's setting ambitions, not telling us how to get there, but setting ambitions. And the water department, the Philly water department is great. They're out there leading. So I'm looking at places where I can gain momentum from other things that are going on to make my argument. Um, we understand that any one of these systems alone in a silo doesn't work. You have to pull it all together and to make the case all together. The idea is that we think of the landscape and the buildings together. That's the ultimate goal, that we're not thinking of one in isolation of the other, but that we're thinking of these systems together. So in this particular project, we decided we can only focus on four things. And even these four things have been challenging. Um, we decided to focus on human health and well-being, stormwater quality and quantity, air quality and habitat. And again, we, have just, we are just skimming the surface here. Um, <clears throat> where are we starting? What's the baseline? And what targets will we set? Well, we started building this argument around human health. And we looked at this is not a qualitative assessment. It's quantitative all of the um, places of recreation, parks, that are within a five minute walk of, um, <clears throat> or, or the, I'm sorry, the radius is five minutes, the diameter is 10 minutes. And we were able to then look at the effect of I-95, the highway that cuts things off. And we were able to identify zones that were completely underserved, represented by the orange. Um, we made this argument for human health and well-being, and that there should be parks for everybody within a five-minute walk in our waterfront project in the, in the red zone. And we said, people have to have access. That's really what this is about. We identified key connector streets. We said there should be a park at the end of every connector street, and that should be on a rhythm of every half mile. Um, and the client bought it. It's really nice. It's become one of the, it's one of my victories. <laughs> at first, they called me really rigid, and then they realized, wow, this is kind of a tagline. We can sell this project with this idea. Um, so that was kind of cool. And we were able to fill in some of these underserved areas along the waterfront. Um, and we started winning that argument. Stormwater quality and quantity. Well, 
this was pretty interesting. We have 61% of the site that's impervious today. That's a lot. We understand um, for stream quality that um, if 10% is impervious, it's sensitive. If it's 25% impervious, it's impacted. Our site is up here in the non-supporting arena at 60%. That's pretty profound when you start putting these kind of metrics on it. But then when we went back to look at our park proposal and added those parks into um, what was already impervious or pervious, we found out that our proposed area um, of impervious is 56%. We were pushing to a target of 40%, so we were shy. What this told us was, guys, if you want to hit that target that we have set, then we need to do something other than parks. There need to be guidelines in place, um, bioswales, green roofs, whatever, that begin to address this issue. Again, we're still, this, pro this project is in process, but this is information that then the, the, the uh, guideline doesn't become something that's arbitrary. And the question then is, does it become policy? Um, so we're in conversation with city planning on this topic. We also decided to tackle the issue of air quality. Really, really difficult issue. We were looking to reduce, at least locally, the air temperature by five degrees. What we determined with our parks proposal was that we were able to locally reduce it by three degrees. And again, we came up with the conclusion for the client that if we are going to further reduce the urban heat island effect, then there need to be design guidelines or policy around green roofs, um, reflective roofs, et cetera, to help build this case. Um, we were also, oh, this is the diagram of the extent of the cooling around our parks that we were proposing. Um, so there is a, there's a substantial impact, but it's not enough. Air quality issues, we were also beginning to look at carbon and the sequestration of carbon. Um, we know that wetlands are one of the most effective, effective sequesters of carbon. And we were looking at small wetlands, and there isn't a precise science, so we're seeing a range of carbon that can be sequestered. But we also know that the Philadelphia airport wants to expand, and they need to build wetlands. And we're saying, gee, you know, here's a funding source for us to potentially build a substantial amount of wetland. Um, and the potential for sequestering carbon adjacent to our site is very high. So we're looking for funding sources and we're looking um, to accomplish some of these other issues. Habitat, um, the existing tree cover on our site is approximately 3%. Um, the Philadelphia Greenworks has a plan of a 30% <coughs> tree coverage. And we are looking to see how that will impact um, how that will impact the entire situation. In fact, we start making this argument not from a habitat perspective, but from dollars saved for other issues, for heating, for cooling, for um, water retention, et cetera. Um, it's hard to make the habitat argument. Um, from a financial perspective just yet, for us anyway. We are struggling with that argument. Um, <clears throat> and so we were also trying to argue with them that um, there are certain areas along this, whoops, what did I do? I exited, what do I do here? Hold on, do I have to go back through this whole thing? Uh, you can select the slide that you were on. How do I do that? Oh. She's going to take care of it. Um, that's what I do at work, too. Sorry. <laughs> um, so we were um, 
we're trying to make the argument about habitat at either end, because there's more land there, um, that that land should be dedicated to a greater amount of habitat. These are very difficult arguments to, to win, um, and we are trying to formulate them. We know it's the right thing to do, but I'll, honestly, not everybody else understands that or feels the same way. And so you have to be very clever in how you make those, those cases. And this is what it's beginning to look like. Um, again, it's a work in process. Leadership, and I'm wrapping up now. Um, I think that the role of landscape architects in leadership has changed. and. Um, more and more landscape architects are leading. You know, residential projects, clearly, landscape architects had a leadership role. They had a very intimate role with their client. Um, we've had those. We have them. They're great. Um, and um, they're fun. They're different. They're highly varied. They're deeply personal. They're psychological. They're all those wonderful things. Um, and they usually get done on the weekends because that's when clients can meet. <laughs> um, but these landscapes, as they become bigger and more complex, like Wagner Park, um, mean that we're stepping into different leadership roles. And I think that's challenging us in ways that perhaps we're not always trained for. Um, to take the reins, you know, architects take the reins, they have no qualms about it. Landscape architects are a little bit shy about this. We are collaborators, we tend to have smaller egos, if you will. We like to listen, we like to put our arms around people and bring them into our fold. Um, but we need to learn to lead. And I think that's a whole skill set and training that more and more of us need to be exposed to. Um, when I did this project, we had about 12 sub-consultants. We were prime, and we had an architect who was our sub who did these pavilions. I was scared to death running this. I'll be honest with you, I was terrified. Um, I had engineers who were my subs, and I had to listen to them talk about pipes, and it was so boring. <laughs> you know, but I learned to talk their language, and I learned to get the things that I needed from them. So when you learn to lead, I think you can learn to influence more and more. Um, this is a project that one of my young partners, um, relatively new partners, is leading down in Washington, D.C. They have 17 subconsultants. And we have a sort of a young associate who's taken this on. And she said, oh my god, Cindy, I had no idea it was so complicated. I don't know what I'm doing. And I'm thinking, whoa, you know, <laughs> Olin needs to get somebody in-house because this is serious. I mean, if I thought Wagner Park was serious, this is 17 subs is even more serious. How you have systems, systems in place to manage and lead a process that's as complicated as Canal Park. I mean, it's, you know, everything, the, the gray field, um, the park, the um, architects, again, we have subs. Um, architects are, are our sub consultants and working with them and having conversations with them and getting information out of them um, and responses out of them that we're interested in, collaborating, creating water systems, um, creating landscapes that transform from winter to summer that incorporate a diverse um, plant palette and cleanse water. Uh, these systems are complicated and we're being brought to the table more and more to lead these conversations. Um, and that's where I want to end because this profession is incredibly complicated. It may seem to you that I haven't talked about design. I know that's what everybody in school is interested in is design. Um, 
this is all about design. It is the integration of these systems into your formal responses. Your formal responses are informed by this information. And I see that as an inseparable conversation. Our landscapes give us great joy. Um, it's one of the things we love about them. They make us feel good. I get goosebumps thinking about it. They really, it's, it's a soulful thing. Um, but we need to be able to not only do that soulful, passionate thing, but do the thing that is right in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're that welcome. was just wonderful. We have some time for questions, and I'll pass the microphone around so we can be sure and catch those on tape. Does anyone have any questions? I know it was a lot. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. <clears throat> uh, one of the issues related to the landscape architecture in the urban area is the impact on air quality and one of the values of the trees and vegetation is to help with air quality and uh, I went to a workshop in Parma, Italy at the International Phytotechnology Society meeting this summer and uh, there were a number of values lifted up with respect to vegetation in the urban area and I wondered whether you wanted to comment on this in any way. Well, I can say absolutely. Um, I perhaps can say we all know this intuitively. Um, we all believe and have known the value of vegetation. I mean, we've learned our, our cycle. We understand all of that. Um, I think we are still all grappling with how to talk about it from a measurable perspective. And there are those folks um, who are working on those issues. And one of the things that I didn't mention, although Stephanie did in her introduction, is that Olin has recently developed a research component to it that is focused on and dedicated to these topics. But I'll, I'll be honest with you, it is really challenging to stay on top of it all. Um, to get that depth of information, we tend to, um, when we are faced with a problem, and I'll be honest with you, this Delaware River investigation for us, we are funding ourselves. Sure, we have a client who's paying our bill, they're paying our bill, but that was long gone. That fee is long gone. We are investing our own dollars in trying to get metrics around these topics. So um, I'm not answering your question specifically, but for us to get deep about that means that we need to go to meetings like that, means we need to be on top of the literature. And boy, if I had an organization this big, and I could afford to devote that much to research, it would be great. The reality is professional service firms can't do that. We're not product driven, um, so our profit margins are very different and we're dealing with um, trying to manage the investigation of those issues with much smaller dollars. Um, and that's a challenge for us, but man, if you have information, I'd love it. <laughs> Yeah. What is, oh, I think you got to talk into the mic. <laughs> so in your experience, what has been the best method of community collaboration in design? Well, I think one of the things that is a must um, is wherever you're working to have a local person who has an expertise in community relationships. And I believe 
in the local touch there and not the outside touch because the local touch understands the subtlety and innuendo. Um, and being advised by that person and listening to that person. Um, when you ask about method, um, their size does matter. If you're expecting a crowd of 1,000, that's a different method than a crowd of 100. A crowd of 100 can be broken into 10 separate groups um, and can be maybe broken into groups by interest. Somebody's interested in historic preservation. Somebody's interested in playgrounds. <clears throat> and let them kind of tackle those issues and report out. That's a very effective method. Um, our Presidio public interface San Francisco is one of the toughest environments to work in. They're very vocal human beings. They're used to being vocal. Um, you know, they hate parking. They hate things that go against their, their principles. And we, we cut out a bunch of stuff. You know, this is what a hundred cars looks like to accommodate. Um, this is what... Um, a space looks like to hold a concert of 400 people. And we let them move things around. And the, the thing that was really effective about that is people stood up and said, this isn't easy. Once you get them to understand that, you're, you're, part, you're halfway there. Because all of a sudden, the energy around fighting is kind of gone, and it's turned into problem solving. And that's really cool. Um, Delaware, we just did Delaware, a public meeting in the waterfront. We had several hundred people, presentation, and then we broke it down into interest groups. So I had the parks. Um, somebody had early action items. Somebody had Penn's Landing. And we did these mini presentations and took questions, so in subgroups. And that was very effective, and we recorded everything. Um, uh, so the, the, the techniques vary. Um, and there are other people who get into real hands-on stuff. Um, I think that I'm a little bit of a product of Lori Olin, who um, is very fond of saying I'll listen to people, but I won't let them tell me how to do it. <laughs> um, I'll listen to what they want, but I won't listen when they start telling me I want a playground over here and it has to be this big by this big. That's a little too specific. So. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you get some of these projects in the office? Is it through RFPs? Is it through knowing clients, competitions? Especially the one where you said you were the lead of 17 different yeah. um, subs. That's really interesting, and it's a great question in this economy. Um, it's also a great question in light of the fact that Olin is in a transitionary period. Um, I've come to believe that every firm is in transition every day of its existence. Um, but for really the first 15 years, 20 years of Olin, Laurie was the primary breadwinner. And that work came in, you know, the phone would ring off the hook. And when he brought in new partners, myself, Susan, Bob, David, um, we started um, struggling with that issue a little bit. How do each of us get work, especially when there's this great hero over here, people calling to work with him? That was a challenge um, that we had to overcome. But I'll tell you when we overcame it. It was about three years ago when I took over the CEO position at Olin. And um, I realized I needed to focus on business development. And the timing couldn't have been more perfect. We actually set up a strategy um, of how to do business development. Um, and then the economy crashed, but our strategy was in place. And for whatever reason, don't ask me, it was the luck of the gods. We decided we would target some cities. And we would go fly people to those cities. And we would meet with 
anybody and everybody in those cities. We would meet with the mayor, the engineers, the architects, um, city officials. Um, we just got to know places, and it was remarkable, truly remarkable, how that impacted us, and um, it made a big difference. So, of course, we have a reputation. People still come to us because they think we, we understand people really well. We are collaborators. We love to play in sandboxes with people. And they come to us because they know that about us. But when we're trying to open up new markets, just getting out there and letting people know you're there, you're interested in what they're doing in the places they are, I have learned, if I've learned one thing, it's all about relationship. It is all about the relationships you build in life. Um, and there is, you know, you might think you do the best design work in the world, but if you don't know anybody, it doesn't matter. If you don't talk to anybody, it doesn't matter. The relationships you're building in school, the relationships you have through your family, um, through your churches, and don't be shy. Man, have I learned that, don't be shy. Because if you're shy, you're dead. <laughs> if you want to do business development, and you have to, to stay alive. Um, we, we have really focused on it, and Olin did not lay anybody off through the recession, knock on wood, um, and we, we're 63 people going into the recession. We're 73 people today. So not only did we not lay people off, we have grown. It's not to say we won't hit a cliff out there. Um, it's not a promise about maintaining that. But that has taken a lot of really, really hard work, more than you wanted to know. But that's how we've done it. Yes. Oh. I was really impressed with the way that you developed your argument around the Delaware River project. Um, and clearly, the, uh, getting the parks every half mile was a major victory. Yeah. But it seemed like many of your other arguments hinged off of that. For example, uh, we can't cool with just the parks alone. Um, and, and so I was curious about, or curious if you could elaborate on how um, you were able to or the process, did you, did you win that park victory first, or were all of these arguments sort of um, linked from the beginning, or how, how did that evolve? Okay, that's, um, we won the park every half mile argument first, and we only won it about a month ago, actually, so it's kind of hot off the press. This issue, the other issues that are there are much more complicated. And the reason that they're complicated is that 90% of that waterfront is in private ownership. Um, so what you saw was what went to the public meeting. Um, we had parks at either end of this project that were much bigger. But because that land is in private ownership, they wouldn't let us show it. It is still an advocacy position that we're maintaining, and we continue to work on that. So we are, we, we know where we're trying to go with this. We have not won that. And we also are in the beginning phases of the dialogues with, dialogue with the city officials about what is policy versus what is wishful. And the, that distinction as a, you know, I'm, I'm not a planner. I don't come from a planning background. But I'm having to learn how to have those conversations and where I can protect the vision for this plan. Um, so we're, 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 it's a work in progress here. Um, the green walls. It sounds nice um, for like cooling the inside, but um, wouldn't that be like very high maintenance for the property owners? And like, wouldn't it kind of like clutter, clutter up the outside? Well, where we've used the green wall, um, in the case that I showed you in Comcast, yes, there was the interior screen, which was used as a sunscreen. 
Um, but outside, we used it to screen something visually. Um, and it was a space maker. We used it as a space maker rather than a space taker, if you will. Um, so that was our strategy. But I, I mean, there are groups out there who are doing very complex and interesting things with green walls today um, that we're not there. Um, and this whole, you know, the whole investigation around vertical agriculture, I think, is a very interesting one. The fact that people are scratching at that surface today tells me it's going to be very real in the next couple of decades. People are saying, oh, it's too expensive, doesn't work. But the people are looking at it. They're looking at it for a reason. And they're looking at it because of population, where people live, um, and fuel, and distances of travel for our food source. Um, fertilizers, you know, there, it's, uh, there, there's a reason people are exploring it. And I, just because people are saying it doesn't work today, mark my words, <laughs> you're gonna, we're going to see it. Not maybe in my lifetime, but certainly in the lifetime of these young folks. We'll take one last question. Uh, could you talk more about the uh, leadership uh, skills uh, or the going into the future and some, maybe some of the qualities that uh, one has to acquire for that? Yeah. Um, Olin has done a fair amount of um, Ex coaching from an external coach. And we started out doing it because um, things weren't particularly rosy on all fronts. And that's another presentation. I gave it at the ASLA um, <laughs> just last month. Um, but we started feeling this need to get in alignment with one another so we could push in the same direction. Why I'm telling you this is um, through that process, we started getting um, and engaging in coaching of our own behavior to be effective, um, to be effective leaders, and to be able to engage in dialogue with our partners, to be able to have effective arguments to run effective meetings. Um, I don't think that enough emphasis is put on that, quite frankly. Um, very little, to my knowledge, in most academic settings. And I know we can't teach everything. You know, Some of it is trial by error, but honestly, uh, anybody who's interested in a leadership position really needs to take leadership training, needs to take have training and presentation skills. I mean, I try to do stuff with my students when they stand at the wall and they talk about their drawing like this, and you're like, what are you saying? Um, those are fundamental skills that, um, so every level people need to understand that there's always room for growth to the next level. And I'm a firm believer in the better you know yourself, the better you can be. So everything from personality testing to disc testing to um, coaching, I think, makes you a stronger leader. Um, on the business development side, we have a coach who is coming in, working with us on business development skills. And um, that isn't stuff we get because it automatically, I mean, some people get it. I think Lori's, quite frankly, a genius around business development. And there's certain things he does that he doesn't even know he does them. Um, but people respond very positively. So dissecting that, what is it, um, really helps, I think, and makes a difference. So it's, part of it is how we engage with, with each other. But I also, there's another piece to this, the leadership piece. And 
I don't know that you teach, can teach, drive or the desire to push and get to the bottom of it or the ability to see an opportunity that um, needs to be taken to the next level. I, I'm not sure how one teaches that. One can certainly put the foundation forward in an academic setting and encourage that this is where we need to go. Um, if I had one bit of advice, it's just because you walk through those doors, the cap and gown, that doesn't go away. That's something that's got to stay with you and in you for the rest of your life to be a leader, to push those boundaries. It doesn't stop in school, and it's kind of hard. I think it's hard for young people when they get in a firm because they don't want to upset the apple cart. They want to do what they're told. They want to do well. They want to succeed. And they may or may not feel comfortable pushing the firm to another place. They may not feel they have the power, the authority to do that. And part of that is the culture of a place. Does the culture encourage that growth? Does the culture um, support that growth? Um, so I think leadership, too, comes from how a firm supports the culture of leadership um, into the future. It's not just the leadership of individuals in the firm, but supporting that leadership opportunity of others in the firm to grow the profession so that it can have a stronger place in the role of leading projects. Well, I said that we just have one last question, and I know that there are some of you that need to leave for the dining halls and go other places. Um, Cindy will be here and can answer more questions, sure. so feel free to, to come up to the front. She's with us until 2.30 tomorrow afternoon, and I encourage you to pick up on these wonderful, um, very thoughtful, and very personal observations about practice. It's a unique opportunity for us, and we really appreciate the marvelous lecture, but also the answers Thanks. to the questions. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.